Hello and welcome to the uh, day three of three day APAC Health Tech Innovation Conclave. We are uh, in the last session of this uh, uh, vibrant uh, mega conclave. Just to take you uh, through the proceedings of last uh, uh, two days, we had a wonderful inaugural session with the uh, chief guest address by uh, the health minister from the state of uh, Chhattisgarh. Uh, Sri T S Dio Singhji, and uh, we also had representation from government of India, Dr. Nita Orma, who is uh, the Director General, National Informatics Centers, Government of India. We also had policy makers representatives from the state of Kerala, uh, from Union Territory, Chandigarh, Mizoram, Uttar Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh, Andaman and Nicobar, and several several other states. At the same time, several healthcare leaders from uh, reputed uh, and uh, chain of hospitals from across the country and also global leaders have joined us for uh, deliberations and uh, power packed uh, uh, panel discussion uh, in last two days and also uh, today in the morning. Uh, at the same time, some technical presentation. While uh, the government of India is promoting digitization of uh, uh, healthcare sector to ease uh, for seamless delivery of healthcare services to the remotest places uh, for the public health. At the same time, those in the hospitals, uh, the present uh, session would be focusing on how the educational institution like universities uh, can lead the transformation to digital health. So to do the honors, we have some esteemed uh, speakers who are uh, the leaders in the education sectors with uh, several years of experience. So join me in welcoming Dr. A. Ravi Kumar, who is the pro vice chancellor Medical and Health Sciences, SRM University Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai. Welcome, Dr. Ravi. Professor Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Arunachalam Ravi Kumar. He is a Pro Vice Chancellor, Medical Health and Sciences, SRM Institute of Science and Technology. He is also the Board of Management and Planning and Monitoring Board, Academic Council. Uh, several positions and awards to his uh, credit. Welcome, Dr. Ravi. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we are also joined by Dr. Raju Yeravkar, who is the Dean Faculty of Health Science, Symbiosis International University. Thank you very much, Dr. Raju, for joining us. And we are also joined by uh, uh, Dr. Prem Nair, who is the Medical Director, Amrita Hospitals, Dean Faculty of Medical Sciences, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetam. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prem, for joining us. Thank you for having me. We are also joined by uh, Dr. P. Balakrishnan Shetty, Vice Chancellor, Sri Siddhartha Academy of uh, Higher Education. <clears throat> Dr. P. Balakrishnan Shetty. Thank you very much, Dr. Bala, for joining us. Thank you. We are also joined by Dr. Kriti Pradhan, who is uh, the Dean Chitkara University of Health Sciences. Thank you very much. Welcome to the uh, panel discussion, Dr. Pritha. Without uh, further ado, uh, I would uh, like to be also joined by yet another eminent speaker from the state of Odisha, mm -hmm. Professor Dr. Ashok Mahapatra. Vice Chancellor Siksha O Anusandhan. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Glad to connect with you. Namaskar. Namaskar. Namaskar, sir. So, uh, we have educationists who are also leading the medical institutions. Some of them themselves are doctors, medical doctors. So, uh, with this, uh, first, I would like to bring on Dr. Prem Nair. Dr. Prem Nair, Medical Director, Amrita Hospitals, also Dean, Faculty of Medical Sciences, Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peter. Sir, we would like to uh, know your view, uh, your initial remarks, 
uh, in this time of covid era where the government of india is promoting digitization of healthcare sector to uh, to deliver seamless healthcare services we would like to know how is your university uh, uh, helping and leading uh, in the transformation of healthcare sector especially in terms of digital health over to you dr thank you uh, sudhir uh, we at the amrita <coughs> university our healthcare campus at cochin in kerala was among the first hospitals in asia to adopt early digital digitization of medical care with the implementation of picture archival and communication system in 1998 we were among the first in asia to introduce ris in the radiology imaging system which was available at the desktop and mobile phone at the desktop of uh, not only radiologists but also uh, physicians on the floors uh, as well as the nursing staff it was a un unusual investment during those days with technology adoption being very very early however today we can say that this is a very sustainable way to go and not only saves cost but also helps in building a very robust research infrastructure and database over the years we have moved ahead we have expanded to a clinical electronic medical records it has been transported across the clinical areas into administration and uh, over the years we have moved ahead and implemented the emr in op and as well as in inpatient areas our share of success has been phenomenal and we have been very active in introducing this concept in many institutions around the country as well as internationally our training programs have substantially benefited by our hospital information system which we initially introduced back in 19 in uh, 1999 when we introduced telemedicine in partnership with ISRO and at that time professor kasturi rangan inaugurated our facility and from then on we have not looked back we have continued to to link up with over 50 centers and several remote hospitals in the andaman and nicobar islands as well as in the the himalayan region and kashmir all of these have proven to be remarkably successful and was able to substantially save costs we were supported by several international faculty we had, had several programs and this was our first uh, venture into digital healthcare and we have continued to expand to include digital simulation setup with virtual reality as well as uh, in with uh, high fidelity mannequins and so on so i will stop here and uh, thank you thank you very much uh, dr prem we are glad to know that uh, uh, you are uh, your organization has been one of the pioneers in integrating uh, the digitization of uh, uh, and integration of technology in healthcare industry so with this i would uh, move on to our next eminent speaker uh, uh from the state of odisha whose uh, institution and medical institutions and hospitals have been uh, very much part of uh, uh, the vaccine trials uh, uh, i would like to call upon dr ashok kumar mahapatra sir over to you <laughs> good afternoon all esteemed panelist let me introduce myself i worked at aims delhi from 75 to 2017 and retired as dean in between i worked as the director of sanjay gandhi institute from 2006 to 2009 and director aims bhubaneswar from 12 to 2016 october everywhere we worked we follow telemedicine and digital health platform 
when i went to sanjay gandhi we had already 1996 cdac approved telemedicine center from where we were doing tele classes tele consultation tele radiology and telepathology this was a project between sanjay gandhi post graduate institute and cdac mahali when i went there we had to expand it so that it can reach medical colleges as medical college networking in up because we have tremendous law, le, number of less number of medical faculty here i must say india is the one of the lowest doctor ratio to the population and also if you see the health care statistics out of 180 countries we are 170 so only 10 country in the world we have better facility than what is india so india require 18 lakhs of doctor in last 75 years or so we have produced 7 and a half lakh of doctor if you go to mci website so we have tremendous disproportionate uh, development of technology versus medical sciences when 1.7 million people do engineering about 80000 to 90000 do so when i come to aims aims started computerization 1987 but because we had involved uh, tisco tcs it was not working that time because the doctors were not motivated and aims could not computerize system because those days it was 386 and all the computer purchase was not able to use but when i went to sanjay gandhi as director we created a national school of telemedicine and i was the director and dr saroj misra was the chairman there looking at telemedicine and we started diploma and bsc in telemedicine and diploma in bioinformatics the question here is that is the telemedicine is the backbone of the healthcare delivery system yes as we are hearing from amrita we started starting the archival of pictures for the gamma knife patient 1996 because at aims delhi we purchased a gamma knife for all the pictures are archived so mri ct angiogram all this because you cannot do it without image interposition and image transposition so we have been using telemedicine for tele education tele consultation tele pathology and tele radiology in form of pack system question is that how much it can contribute to pandemic i just told you when the pandemic started most of the government hospital closed down because shortage of doctors so all the strength was concentrated on management of covid patient but we because i re retired from aims delhi at a 65 years of age 2017 now i'm working in Sanjay, uh, here in bhubaneswar and we had 2250 beds of covid 2200 covid patients and in month of august and september we are full and we are running all consultation from different places through our tele consultation which was tele medicine platform you imagine that from bhubaneswar there are 2 to 300 kilometers and bhubaneswar has the major center with 550 beds with 200 icu beds rest other 1500 percent of covid beds spread over five different hospital and we used to give radiology and icu care facilities consultation through telemedicine so telemedicine is important for tele education tele consultation tele follow up archival of pictures and many things which also related to education because during the pandemic we had our mbbs exit exam md exam exam online the the faculty did not come the external did not come so we could have our post graduate exam mch dm exam we have about 10 specialties cardiac surgery neurosurgery plastic surgery urology and about 20 super specialty branches in my hospital because we have a running hospital of 1500 beds and we had created 2200 covid beds and i again remind you we did not close down our normal routine opds as and when we are running it because the other government hospitals were not working so we did justice to our patient working to physically and also giving consultation to telemedicine for the covid patients 
and also the district magistrate and municipality commissioner where the bed was shortage they could transmit the data through tele system and we can tell them whether they need to travel 100 km 200 km with a ventilator or not because when the icu beds were not adequate in the district level they are all transferred to bhuvaneswar to our hospital because we had about 200 icu beds in our covid hospital at bhuvaneswar so i say that telemedicine has become a backbone of the medical system be it for education for training for the simulation for the virtual operation theater or even tele consultation many thing like that but during pandemic it really helped quite a lot and i hope for the future telemedicine will be one of the greatest help to the medical professional i am sure it is going to help all so i am very much into it and we use it and we use it for last more probably 25 years thank you thank you uh, thank you uh, professor uh, uh, ashok mahapatra uh, for uh, being there uh, at the time of covid as well when there was a very uh, the emergency where the government systems were not sufficient enough to support the uh, to contain the covid uh, the pandemic covid so uh, now i would move on to our next eminent speaker from the state of tamil nadu chennai uh, colonel dr a ravi kumar Pro vice chancellor medical health and science srm institute of science and technology over to you sir we would like to have uh, to hear from you on the best practices and innovation how your institute is contributing and spearheading uh, towards the digital health uh, good afternoon can you hear me yes sir we can hear you good afternoon respected colleagues my uh, co speakers and thanks to apac for the opportunity now as you all have experienced uh, i also suddenly fell into this covid situation within a month of joining this post and then we had to really adapt a lot of things in our hospital we have a health sciences and medical faculty consisting of seven colleges the nursing dental occupational therapy physiotherapy and of course the medical college being the largest of lot so the medical college and hospital were functioning but the rest had to close down so when it ha happened actually we had to adapt our hospital we were ordered by the government of tamil nadu to close down the regular opds so we had no option but to close down during the lockdown period but we divided the hospital into three zones a zone which was completely exclusively for fever and covid which had an access which was guarded and then the patients also were protected and taken to a separate identified covid wards we had 200 of them 200 beds of the 1200 beds that we have and then we had an icu dedicated as well as a operating theater and then the next big issue was how to prevent our health workers from getting the infection while we had the ppe and all the other precautions which are recommended one innovative thing which we did in our institution which was uh, a very nice thing uh, i somehow felt that the paper trail rather the paper which is carried inside and outside the covid zone namely the k sheets and other documents would be a source of infection which would be passing on to non infected people so we removed all paper and all wooden things from the covid areas whatever could not be cleaned with your hypochlorite was removed and we did a land system we developed it and we had a voice dictation system thereby our nurses and doctors working in the covid zone need not have to actually type on the computer so voice activated system which was transmitted by land to a room outside the covid zone where the cases actually were printed out 
and as the doctor and nurse finished their duties, they were actually signing off. That was the one innovative thing we did. The second is that the donning doffing drill, which we had given to all our staff, including the uh, housekeeping staff, the ambulance, the attenders pushing the trolleys, all this gave a very good result. The result was that we did not lose a single one of our hospital or health workers due to COVID. We did have about 50, 60 of them falling sick, but we did not have a single death. Secondly, we had treated about 1,600 plus patients in our hospital during the last one year, of which I think we had about 33 deaths. Uh, comparatively, low mor mor mortality rate. The third thing is that we had also simultaneously started our clinical trial for the co-vaccine. SRM was the only hospital selected for the co-vaccine trial in Tamil Nadu, in which all the three phases, one, two, and three, was done by this hospital. And successfully, we had managed to do it without any major uh, with a complication, and now the vaccine is in use. We have also found that a lot, large number of students who were on online classes, and a lot of people who are actually working in the hospital and with the COVID, were having a lot of mental stress. So, an exclusive mental health act was developed by our psychiatry department and it was called For You. And anybody could log in and could get in touch with the psychiatrist 24 by 7. And we had a huge success with that. A lot of people could find time to actually interact with the psychologist or a psychiatrist to help them. Or well, coming to medical education, since you say the university is what they did, we, we, are, we have completely switched over to online system of classes, theory, for all the colleges. So this was a new experience to many people. And we are practicing blended learning. The other thing which we had found difficulty was the practicals and clinical examination, clinical training. So what we did was that we converted our simulation lab we started using it much more than ever not only for the medical college but all the other colleges where we could not hold practical classes in the campus it was in the form of demonstration of practical uh, experiments or clinical science were demonstrated and it was also given as projects to the students to perform in their home and report back. So this is again another use of a digital technology for the betterment of education. We have, we have been blessed with a wonderful simulation lab. It's a state status center and it has facility for uh, conducting simulation based training for almost all the health science colleges we have. And then we had the fourth problem that how to reach out to the masses. So we had started our telemedicine center pretty late, only last year it was commissioned. And as my previous esteemed speaker was referring, telemedicine came as a boon, not only for teleconsultations, which we did, but also for educating the masses who were health workers in the periphery. Also, we used telemedicine for other health science colleges like teleaudiology, teletherapy, especially speech therapy. All those things were done in the telemedicine center. So all in all, digital technology is actually a boon, but it is definitely uh, something which a generation like ours had to adapt and learn. As you yourself saw just a little while ago, I was out of your 
zone because I could not get the transmission. And then when I switched the computer, it happened. Now I'm talking through a different computer. So the Wi-Fi is fine. There is something wrong with my laptop. So one has to be actually digitally savvy. And this is the situation when you have to teach the old dog a new trick. And that's the challenge we have because our youngsters are very smart in these things, but then we have to adapt. So right now I have introduced in our medical college, a learning management system for the MBBS students. And then we found that the students were very fast to adapt, but when it came to the faculty, they were hesitant, but then they had to be coaxed and then now they are adapting it, adapting to it. And we find that the, the the feedback from the student is extremely good. So all in all, it's been a learning period, challenging period. And then only the last bit which I want to say is, at the end of the day, what is important? The proof of the pudding is in eating. So we did take a feedback from our students and the, especially the interns who graduated during this time and how they felt about this whole thing, because they were the ones who were all the time saying that patients are not there. And the parents were complaining that we are not giving adequate protection to them. And whenever one intern or a postgraduate parallel with COVID, we had to really face a lot of music. But at the end of the day, when we asked them the feedback, was the BLS and ACLS training useful in the simulation lab? 100% said yes. When we asked that, did the simulation-based hands-on training improve your psychomotor skills? 100% said yes. Did you have the opportunity to apply this on real patients during your internship period? 93% said yes, because emergencies were being treated during this period also. Suturing techniques, etc. were you happy with that? What was taught? 97% said yes. And finally, and did you apply this on real patients? 95% was happy. So I think digital methods are good. They are expensive. They need to be learned and they need, we have to adapt ourselves. In addition to your physical facilities, digital facilities are good, but then the cost definitely goes up. So that's the biggest challenge, how to bring the cost down. And if you can overcome that challenge, I think it will be a great way to learn and teach. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful, sir. Glad to uh, know the wonderful assessment uh, uh, that your institution has taken up about this uh, digital initiatives within your, uh, within your organization. Uh, I'll come back to you with uh, yet another following question. Now I would like to call upon our esteemed speaker from the state of Karnataka. Uh, Vice Chancellor for the Sri Siddhartha Academy of Higher Education, Dr. P. Balakrishna Shetty. He himself is a medical doctor. Uh, over to you, sir. Good afternoon to all the speakers and uh, organization of uh, telemedicine conclave. Um, I would like to say uh, I am a radiologist. So, and uh, my university is uh, doing a lot of work on these uh, teleradiology perspectives. Uh, we are not only doing teleradiology for the local community, the regional community, but also for the global community. On this behalf, uh, actually, we conducted a webinar on uh, telemedicine as a cost-effective uh, project for rural healthcare. Uh, it was organized uh, in the Consortium of Universities of Global Health. The meeting was organized in uh, Washington, D.C., along with all other universities like uh, Harvard, Stanford, and other uh, major universities. And Sri Siddhartha University conducted this program on telemedicine, which will be useful for uh, most of the people. Of course, uh, telemedicine, uh, teleradiology was there uh, almost for the last, uh, I would like to say, for the last 20, 30 years. Even today, uh, I report almost 50 to 100 uh, cross-sectional images, including CT scan and MRI. And it includes uh, the state of Karnataka, almost all the states of India, the Northeast, uh, the Middle East, uh, and also a couple of hospitals uh, from Africa. So teleradiology was there for a long time. Uh, uh, the importance of teleradiology, we felt the importance of teleradiology because of uh, 
the health situations in some of the rural districts of Karnataka. For example, uh, uh, can I share some of the slides? Yes, sir, you can. Okay, uh, how can I go ahead with that? Uh, at the bottom, you have uh, an option called share. Okay, okay, I'll share the slides. Okay. Uh, share slides. Share, okay. Uh, share screen, okay. Can you click on that and select the... Uh, first, you need to open the slide, uh, the slides up in your laptop or computer. Okay. I opened it. Then go yeah. to the... Now, can you uh, click on the share button of the screen? Share, okay. Can you see the slides? Not yet, sir. No problem. Then I'll uh, then I'll go ahead. No problem. I'll go ahead with my presentation. Okay. Uh, if it is uh, okay, now I'll go ahead with my presentation. That's better, I think. So the the actual problem was that, uh, like uh, for example, basically in the head injury, like we had uh, some situation where there was a head injury of a child. Then uh, generally with the head injury, generally they'll have some headache, unconsciousness, vomiting and all those things. Uh, and uh, these patients uh, will be usually trans transferred to major healthcare centers like NIMANS. So they come all the way. Uh, they come all the way from rural areas, about 300 kilometers, 400 kilometers to our uh, um, uh, NIMANS, that is a, a neurology center. And they do a CT scan there. And with the CT scan, they say, no, oh, there is no hemorrhage, no nothing. And they'll send back the patient back to the native place. Because if there is no hemorrhage, there is no role for any neurosurgeon or neurologist to act upon. Similarly, if there is some patient who has got a head injury, and if there is a head injury, and if there is um, hemorrhage inside, then he needs immediate uh, you know, attention. So all these patients, uh, if they got a CT scan, these uh, images will be transferred to our university. And we take a call whether there is a hemorrhage, number one, or whether there is no hemorrhage at all. And if there is a hemorrhage, either it is an emergency or not an emergency. So we can take a decision whether in cases of head injury, we can take a decision whether there is an actual surgical intervention is uh, required or not. So this is uh, one of the application of uh, teleradiology where we are in. You can take a decision whether a, a surgical intervention or a clinical intervention or any other intervention is required or the patient just needs to go home and we uh, and you know he, he has to be observed. And the uh, uh, that is how we started teleradiology and we started uh, collaboration with the ISRO for starting teleradiology. Now our university has got a tie up with uh, uh, about uh, 5 to 10 primary healthcare centers. Okay, these primary healthcare centers of the Karnataka state, there may be in state uh, government run primary healthcare centers, there may, may not be uh, the experts in various fields, let it be medicine, surgery, gynecology, or dermatology, or super speciality like nephrology, urology, neurology. So they may not be there in all primary healthcare centers. So we have a community that all these primary healthcare centers will have a, some community chamber where the patients will come and one uh, staff nurse will be there. She will take the history. And she will send the details of this particular uh, patient to our uh, telemedicine center in the university. And from our university, our uh, medical uh, specialists uh, in various um, neurology, nephrology, and cardiac surgery, they will give an opinion on these particular patients. So the transportation of these patients, whether they require a surgical intervention or non-surgical intervention or just a medical prescription, that all these things will be decided by the doctors who are sitting in the telemedicine center of our university. So this is how uh, we have been uh, doing this uh, telemedicine facility for the rural areas of our uh, university, basically the primary health care centers and community health care centers. So uh, there are uh, no the two, uh, you know, there are no questions about the advantage of telemedicine. Everybody feels that telemedicine, teleradiology is absolutely important, especially with the particular pandemic of the present pandemic of COVID, wherein 
the patient also uh, patient also got apprehension to go to the hospital and similarly the doctors also have got apprehension in uh, in examining the patient but the disadvantages of telemedicine are very very important to be understood at this uh, at this juncture the number one the most important disadvantage is the availability of power and internet because we talk about telemedicine teleradiology for the remote areas of our country we need to see that this particular areas do have the power and the internet for the sake of power we also got into so many discussions with the government and we are planning to have the solar uh, power so that uh, there is a power there is a continuous power through solar so that you need not uh, uh, depend too much on electricity so solar is one of the solutions for giving a telemedicine so that the telemedicine will work efficiently in the rural areas the second problem of telemedicine is a internet so of course uh, india is developing as a greatest uh, tele uh, internet center so i think we will also have a great uh, uh, internet connectivity for all these patients but the third most important uh, limitation of telemedicine is the apprehension of the doctors the doctors of our country they are all worried about because if there's a telemedicine i think uh, most of these consultations will be done by other doctors so doctors have got an apprehension if telemedicine takes a major role then it becomes a big problem for the doctors to give personal um, uh, you know personal attention for all these patients so these are the things uh, which are very very important to be discussed during this uh, uh, digital health or a telemedicine uh, conclave and finally what i would like to say of course uh, the first speaker told about the number of hospitals uh, number of uh, doctors uh, somehow i have got a lot of reservations regarding this statistics we keep on talking about the statistics about the number of hospitals available in the country number of doctors we talk we say that the number of hospitals are less the number of doctors are less these are all the statistics i would love to say given by the western countries because we are not here to follow or Uh, you know uh, imitate the standards of the western countries if the western country has got a number of more hospitals number of more doctors we are not it is not necessary to follow their statistics or their numbers we need to find out whether our people are happy or healthy that is the most important statistics we have to give rather than counting the number of hospitals or doctors in our country um we we overall we feel with the you know honorable prime minister at the helm of fifers in giving the telemedicine and telemedicine services to remote parts of this country i think we need to work hard we need to think of innovative ideas how to give healthcare for our rural people rather than just thinking about the number of hospitals and number of doctors in this country and i think that is my conclusion my remark on this particular topic thank you very much uh, dr shetty as you rightly mentioned uh, this is a large uh, problem that is lying <clears throat> while we talk about taking healthcare services to the remotest place uh, there are challenges of existing infra infrastructure uh, especially uh, the internet and the power uh, i would come back to you in the second round of question uh, following question now i would uh, come to a next speaker dr raju yarabdekar who is the dean faculty of health science symbiosis international university over to you sir your view on this uh, thanks uh, sudhir am i audible <coughs> yes sir you are audible uh, uh, no, thank you and it is indeed a pleasure and honor to be with this esteemed panel uh, well you brought out a very vital uh, cross section and inter uh, interjection of ideas of technology into healthcare and in healthcare i would further divide it into uh, i mean technology and education and education and healthcare and we need to understand that the deploy deployment of technology in education in a way cross links with deployment in healthcare delivery in the hospital so as a symbiosis university hospital and research center i would like to discuss these issues on two uh, planes one from the educational point of view and second one is from the healthcare delivery point of view and much of it quite resonates with what dr uh, ravi kumar uh, mentioned at the srm university and uh, it may be a please pleasure to for him to uh, know that uh, dr vijay sagar his erstwhile colleague at the srm university is now the dean of our medical college at symbiosis so basically at the educational uh, uh, cross section it is 
we have adopted new technologies and as one of the speakers rightly said it is the apprehension and the mindset challenges or as uh, as the speaker speaker said it is teaching the old dogs the new tricks and uh, well even the new dogs have to be taught newer techniques and uh, newer tricks but it is the apprehension the reluctance and the uh, lackadaisical approach of senior faculty members to adopting technology both in education and healthcare delivery and i shall come to deployment in healthcare delivery at a later point of time when i talk about the deployment of technology in healthcare but it from the educational standpoint of view it is the 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 uh, probable resistance and every change is uh, subject to resistance uh, the resistance of the faculty to undergo uh, to deploy technology into adopt technology and as a multidisciplinary university uh, our faculty of media and communication conducted a wonderful workshop for all the faculty members at the symbiosis university that before we engage or uh, indulge in online teaching or online learning for that matter we simply don't know the teachers of today or most of the healthcare professional don't know how to be simply camera ready it's a different thing to teach by the chalk and talk method and we we can see the grimaces and the facial expressions of the students uh, the recipients across the face in the classroom but in an online mode with the videos of the students who are smarter than us being switched off at times it becomes difficult to understand the take and the receptivity and the uh, the the feedback the virtual the visual virtual facial feedback of the participants and it's a different ball game altogether to teach online versus to teach physically in classroom so that was a wonderful um, faculty development program which the faculty of media and communication did for all the faculty members at symbiosis international university more so for the faculty of health and biological sciences and more so for the medicos who are used to usually probably interacting uh, physically in person the second thing is we need to understand as someone rightly said that the students of today are much smarter than what they were when we were or when we were students and technology is at the click of a button at the press of a uh, of a finger and they are always one step ahead of what we know and what we prob probably can um, uh, deploy so the teaching uh, the 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 deployment of technology at symbiosis international university has been at three different levels one it is the teaching second is when i say uh, learn the second one is learning when i say learning it is the training of the faculty and the third one is the assessment of the teaching which has been done by the faculty and all these let me make a very strong statement all these are just a complement but never a supplement to physical on classroom teaching they can add or more so clinical exposure the basic simple absence of a haptic feeling on virtual uh, mode of teaching and learning can never supplement what what we get by patient feed, uh, patient uh, being felt and to this extent i'm uh, i'm delighted to learn from dr ravi kumar that the feedback which was given by the students was always in excess of 95% but uh, i i i would uh, i would take it with a pinch of salt no disrespect meant to you dr ravi kumar that conducting a even a simple thing like a bls workshop in person versus conducting a bls on online would uh, would i would opt for doing it physically but i do understand that the covid has been a great teacher and it has constrained or rather mandated for all of us to adopt technology having said this at symbiosis from the educational standpoint of view we have deployed technology for uh, a large number of online teaching uh, whether it's through google whether it's through zoom webex google hangouts cisco webex meets um, again uh, dr vijay kumar the dean of the medical college has implemented a very robust lms uh, teaching system we we have a lot of uh, mobile enabled m uh, teaching uh, by way of various um, uh, apps whether it's the facebook insta or the uh, on the social media or whether it's by whatsapp messages the telegram for small groups of discuss, small group discussions and as someone rightly said um uh, the, the the pre recorded videos and the video conferencing which we have with faculty and students as master classes become a, a great assistance in imparting technology based education needless to mention we too also have a very important and a very robust symbiosis center for uh, health skills which imparts a lot of technology based education simulation based education and we have conducted a large number of aha workshops 
ATLS workshops, ITLS workshops, which have uh, which have uh, given. Uh, we've not taken a formal feedback, but we, uh, at the end of the session, we did have a good uh, uh, you know sense of appreciation by the participants. As I said, there has been a lot of feedback, uh, faculty development programs for the master trainers, the teachers in uh, these um, uh, domains. Uh, from the health sciences, within health sciences, the medical nursing, even the uh, non-clinical programs such as the dietetics and nutrition or the masters in hospital healthcare management or for that matter, even the masters in public health. We have done a lot of online teaching, learning and assessment. And then coming to the, the, uh, the healthcare delivery part of it, well, our hospital has been established for just a couple of years. So we are in the process of uh, taking a deployment of technology to the next level. So we, we have not achieved the proficiency of, uh, 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 in, say, for example, in teleradiology as uh, Dr. Uh, from uh, uh, the Vice Chancellor of the uh, Sri Siddhartha University mentioned. But the, the adoption of electronic health records, uh, library management system, uh, LMS, uh, a PAC system is all uh, 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 done and it's in the upward uh, swing. Uh, similarly, we've got a very strong uh, Center for Applied Artificial Intelligence, and we are looking at all applications of applied interventions, whether it's predictive analysis, whether it's diagnosis, automation of various processes, which uh, we are looking at, even for that matter, for example, the pharmacy information system. So these are in the process of being developed as a young hospital. Uh, we are uh, exploring actively with stakeholders and with senior professionals the adoption of virtual reality training or the robotic surgery, which will come. And of course, teleradiology and telepathology comes in um, as a natural sequel to the growth. Uh, one important thing, which uh, particular area of success, which we have mentioned was, which was mentioned previously, I think so by Dr. Ravi Kumar again, is the phenomenal success we've had in online consultation from, from the Symbiosis Center for Emotional Wellbeing. And the Symbiosis Center for Emotional Wellbeing is one of such uh, isolated institutes established on campus of educational institutes of the stature of a university to provide online mental health services to the staff and students of uh, the university uh, to in various uh, aspects, whether it's relationship problems, whether it's financial problems, whether it's learning difficulties or anything to support the students. The simple uh, take home message of this uh, online services is let's talk. It's important. It's there's nothing to feel shy of a mental health problem. And the approach of the Symbiosis Center of Emotional Wellbeing is to, the fundamental approach is to destigmatize the recourse or resource of mental health services just because it is stigmatized in society, just that because it is taboo in society to uh, resource uh, mental health. Well, uh, what the Vice Chancellor of Sri Siddhartha University said, yes, we do have bandwidth challenges, we do have internet challenges. Uh, because as the Symbiosis Center for Community Outreach Program and Extension, the outreach arm of the Symbiosis International University is concerned, we've adopted close to about 22 villages in the nearby vicinity of the university. And it is our ongoing efforts to uh, set up a very robust telehealth and tele-consultation um, uh, services. But in the remote interiors, yes, internet and bandwidth issues pose a huge challenge. Our objective is not only to launch the telemedicine services, but to supplement it by telehealth uh, domestic services to provide the complete um, around the loop uh, services, not only from consultation, but uh, therapeutic services at the doorstep, especially of the marginalized or the access compromised uh, population to make telehealth a meaningful exercise. And I would agree with all the speakers that uh, technology and the deployment of the same both in education and in healthcare delivery is here to stay. And as a university hospital and research center, as a university, we are more than happy to adapt our technology. We have, we have, we've undertaken that journey, but I do firmly believe that no one can claim an attainment of a destination. It's an ongoing journey with continuous scope for improvement, improvisation um, in the continuous journey. That's all what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raju, for sharing the best practices and innovation in your organization. As you said, it's a constant process where uh, the technology, the best practices are adopted. And in this age where the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, COVID-19 has pushed uh, the change, uh, the significant change uh, for everyone to accept it and adapt it. Now we would move on to 
Dr. Preeti Pradhan, Dean uh, with the Chitkara University uh, for University of Health and Sciences. Ma'am, we would like to have, uh, if you can share the best practices, uh, how is your university uh, contributing to transform, uh, transformation for the digital health? Thank you. Uh, I think it's been a very uh, stimulating discussion and insights from the different speakers so far. Uh, and good evening, uh, everyone. Um, I would kind of just like to share it probably as uh, five points. One, I think uh, digital health is um, is is going to kind of uh, is, is like a paradigm shift, and it's not about a particular department. We are talking about a transformation of the health system enabled through digital health. And universities become a great place for actually all of this to happen. So the most simplest way uh, how universities help and at Sipkara, what we've been doing is basically looking at the curriculum. So out there, everybody is talking about, let's say, robotics, artificial intelligence, wearables, um, mHealth, et cetera. And we looked at our curriculum. You know, it doesn't matter which group, whether it's healthcare management, it's allied health sciences, it's physiotherapy, whatever the different programs are. And we looked at whether we were teaching all of this and how could we incorporate digital health into the curriculum. So that's kind of, I think, the most simplest way any university can uh, contribute because we are uh, part of grooming, uh, you know, the future healthcare providers. So uh, in a university, we are far better equipped to train and teach people as opposed to, you know, them reaching a particular uh, organization or a startup and they have a set of requirements which are not which the students at that point do not possess so there's definitely uh, one part on curriculum integration matching it more with the industry expectations we're also seeing that um, uh, from last year when uh, we also went uh, online completely um, teaching we figured out a way when it was theory class uh, in different ways, we were able to make it happen. Obviously, on the clinics and the practicals, uh, that posed uh, a slightly different kind of challenge. And I think that's where uh, telemedicine or teleoptometry or telephysiotherapy or whatever the options are kind of helped because on one side is uh, definitely providing care to patients, but the other side is how do we use this as a training tool? for the students who are there. So they're kind of trained on that while still in the university. The other part is um, in this uh, way of working uh, where we're able to have all these webinars and get uh, experts from across the country, across the world, um, you know, in, in, a, in a one hour session, so to speak. This enabled us to actually organize also a series of um, really good webinars wherein we were able to bring global healthcare experts to our students. We were also able to, um, I would say this was quite interesting, we organized a series of almost 10 webinars wherein we um, kind of had as the speakers our frontline workers in the sense one was just on ASHA workers. So we bought, uh, we had, let's say, four ASHA workers. So somebody, an ASHA worker working in Punjab, working in Orissa, working in Kerala, you know, working in different parts. And we listened to them. How did they work during this time? And uh, we did sessions like this uh, for ANMs. We did it for self-help groups. We did it for um, to understand how uh, elected women representatives, you know, they could be uh, sarpanch or different. How were all of them working in their community in the COVID times to kind of mitigate and do referrals and connect? And for us, it was learning about how much they are connected what are the technologies they are using? And for our students, it was just another level of exposure because digital health is not 
about uh, at only happening at tertiary care facilities, but it is happening today in India, luckily, at really at the ground level or at the community. So it was very inspiring. We listened to stories, uh, for example, um, I particularly remember this uh, community worker. Uh, she was from Orissa and she had, um, uh, she was very good at all these uh, local folk songs and she was recording health messages in that and somebody was helping her upload it to YouTube or something so that the community could get awareness about you know what kind of care to be taken so uh, use of whatsapp for training um, at uh, you know at the uh, certain at the community level so all of this gave our students a better insight how to connect from across all spectrum from the public health perspective to a very tertiary care kind of and how do all these students who are still in training kind of fit in so I think that broader health exposure helped our students get better ends insight and also uh, kind of um, decide what are the gaps that are still there. So we launched a, a focus on research, which was to look at how can our health science students get more into digital health from facilitating Sitkara University has a very good system of facilitating innovations and patents. So one of the things I always used to notice was we always get engineering students who are doing a lot of work in this area. They come and ask us a lot of questions, you know, how to do this. But then the number of uh, similar initiatives by the health science students was on the lesser side. So we looked at how to increase that within, because within the university, uh, the collaboration between different, you know, it's uh, health science students with an engineering or a business management or whatever is required. It's, it's quite good. So that was another thing that we really tried to um, improve on. So there are a lot of uh, patents which have been filed, uh, which are looking at uh, application of whether it's uh, wearables or augmented reality or maybe there are some research going on about um, application of mobile health and how it can work in a particular way. So we are looking at uh, PhD thesis, master's projects to be focused on these areas which are very, very useful and like. So that was another area. The third uh, area was uh, in the realm of uh, entrepreneurship. So again, what is it we can do to kind of close the gap because when um, in, uh, digital health is of course there, there are all these technologies, but at the same time, there are several gaps in terms of how do you connect uh, what could be like, for example, um, there is Uber, you know, it, it, it's very common and everybody uses it. But a similar facility in healthcare, there are, of course, several which are being tried. Some do exist, but not to the scale and level that is there in like a Zomato types or a Swiggy. And there will be concerns. But the point is, we're all trying to achieve universal health coverage. So um, I think this technology facilitates that process. And the other thing I feel to keep in mind is um, industry academia collaboration has been extremely promoted. So we see organizations uh, at the scale of Microsoft and Google getting very big into healthcare. Uh, on another side, um, organizations like Siemens, G, and Philips, they're also like so much heavy into healthcare. So collaborations have really helped in ensuring, you know, kind of like the finishing training that is required for students to kind of better meet uh, the jobs that they're going to get. I think that's getting better uh, with uh, all these opportunities. So I think uh, there is a host of opportunities and uh, it's also about sensitizing the leadership at the top that you know digital health is here to stay and we really need to kind of take it forward across all uh cadres of staff so uh that would be my input 
Thank you. Absolutely uh, uh, right, uh, Dr. Preeti. And we are glad that your focus is uh, including the e-health and digital health in the curriculum. And at the same time, you are exploring the, uh, the cases, case studies around the, uh, within the university. Now, uh, further, I would come to all the esteemed uh, panel speakers uh, for their concluding remarks on one particular thing that, that is, what is the vision they would look at how the educational institution as your respective universities uh, should be contributing towards the digital health uh, in the coming days? What would be your desired vision? I would come to Dr. Prem Nair for that. In a one-liner, sir, uh, very briefly, yeah. If you can uh, uh, unmute your phone, sir, or unmute your computer. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, yeah. Well, I think the most significant aspect for of digital healthcare for the next decade is one of studying the cost implications of digital healthcare. I strongly feel that digital healthcare is here to stay, but at the same time, there is a lot of potential to help reduce the cost of healthcare and provide efficient, high patient satisfaction related, high best of outcomes can all be managed with digital healthcare. And we cannot uh, do without healthcare at the do without digital healthcare at the present time, because the entire technology of healthcare is moving towards digital systems, and the analog systems have been thrown out of the window because they are inaccurate and they are high cost. So these digital devices that are getting uh, more and more available and and are at the same time. Uh, getting smaller and smaller and easy to use and is we are able to reach out and connect with the community out in the rural areas. India has the highest level of uh, digital mobile telephones, which really is a computer in your palm and it can do pretty much everything that a desktop computer can do or probably even more and be able to relate to various apps that come through and are useful on the fly. So I think that that is the single most important thing. And secondly, education cannot do with digital, without digital health care because education is proven to be far more effective and enhanced by digital health care in the setting of skills development. The old rote memory-based training is out. We need to focus on skills development, patient safety and efficiency and satisfaction and improved outcomes, which can be managed in, a, in any university through digitization of their services. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prem Nair. Uh, I would come to Professor Dr. Ashok Mahapatra, a brief concluding uh, one-liner remark, sir, what would be your desired or uh, experienced vision uh, for the universities uh, in terms of digital health. See, uh, as our previous speaker spoke about the cost, the cost is very high. And when one system you follow, means after a few years, it gets outdated. For example, in Sanjay Gandhi, we are following CDAC system, and five years' time, when we have to upgrade, it becomes from one crore to 15 crore. And it was by one of the TCS and all this. So every time one platform you use for digital health, when you shift to another five years time to another system, it doesn't match. So my problem will be we should have health electronics and doctors should work together so that when you outdated a system, the new system should take over the old system. For example, for 10 years, we work on the one digital platform from CDAC. When you take over to the TCS, TCS system was not taking the data. So you are going to lose most of the data because one platform is not compatible to another platform. So when you talk about any system, today we all know how rapidly one 
digital system or one format become outdated within three, four years. So you will have not only initial investment for e-health, you have to have continuous investment because the system is going to upgrade and you will not be able to match it. That is how we started computerization in AIMS in 1987 for two crores. And in 2016, it became 100 crores. The question is that, and I can tell one thing, all these new AIMS where I was director and we are all, all the project mode, all the new AIMS has all the parameters for digital health. Yet, when you come to functioning, it doesn't work 100% because the platform you design at the time of DCR and platform you install time of working, the gap of 10 years. So the question is, if you see Ames Buenesor, I was director. He started the project at batch by time and not yet completed. And in 10 years time, two different digital platforms has become outdated. So now one system doesn't take the data from another. Then you are going to lose huge amount of data. So it is always good to have digital. But when you talk about disadvantages, then you realize how quickly they outdated themselves the system and how the old system and new system do not match. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Now I would come to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Lepne Kalnil Arunachalam Ravi, sir. Sir, your concluding remark, uh, that would be uh, the vision, desired vision towards digital health. Uh, by the universe. Uh, thank you. I, I quite agree with both my previous speakers. The digital learning, digital health is the way forward and it's something you have to accept. We can try as much as possible to resist, but it's, going to, it's happening, it's going to happen. Three years ago, I attended a vice chancellor's conference at IAM Fishy, where not only medical, but all other which is mainly management and other sciences were there. I heard them talking and discussing, and Dr. Prem Singh, who was one of the members of the panel which chose the Institute of Excellence, he predicted that in a few years' time, it was Industrial Revolution 4.0, and he said everything in this world in the future will be controlled by this device. And everything will become controllable by your mobile smartphone. And as you have seen, the smartphones initially were very expensive. They were not affordable. Now, slowly, they have become acceptable, even though the cost is not that cheap. But inevitably, they have got accepted because the ease of use, the saving of time, and the amount of benefit you get is more than anything else. And the generation which is growing up now is adapted to a digital learning. So that's supposed to be the norm. So what I predict is that there will be a lot of involvement of AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. in the health care sector as well as in the education sector. These will come in and they'll make it much more simpler and easier to access uh, educational content as well as healthcare anywhere. The challenge remains connectivity, challenge remains affordability, challenge remains what do the people who are digitally not savvy, how do they communicate, how do they get into this. The digital divide will be there, the digital divide has to be narrowed down and we have to get people more and more involved that is the way forward so it's either you have it or you have to pay the price for it not having it that's my message thank you thank you very much sir now i come to dr bala uh, sir your brief concluding remark uh, a one liner what, uh, what I would like to say is that digital healthcare is not blindly following the standards of the Western countries. Digital healthcare is unique for the Indian situation. 
by the by the damage covid-19 has created in the western countries we should learn that we should stop following the standards of the western countries the way india has given vaccine for more than 60 countries in the world we are the leaders of healthcare so what i would say stop following these countries for healthcare stop counting the number of hospitals stop counting the number of doctors in this country see whether our people are getting good healthcare or not for that my ultimate aim is to uh, co collaborate all these private healthcare centers with the state community healthcare centers and provide telemedicine and telehealth care for primary healthcare centers thank you thank you very much uh, dr rajiv your concluding remarks sir if you can unmute yeah since you had asked to limit ourselves to one sentence i'll just make it very brief all limitations of digital digitalization whether it's in the healthcare or in the education sector considered notwithstanding digitization is here to stay whether it's in the education or in the healthcare sector we should learn to not only accept it but embrace it and that's the way forward if we are to uh, you know achieve the overall game uh, the goals of education or healthcare whether it's accessibility affordability availability equity expands reach whatever these buzzwords you talk which are common and synonymous with both the sectors digitization is here to stay and it's something akin to saying a version n we talked about version 1.0 2.0 3.4 here this is version n.0 where n stands for eternity we have to accept digitization as a part and parcel of life there's no looking back whether it's artificial applied in uh, applied artificial intelligence whatever you take there it is here to stay that's it thank you very much sir uh, dr preeti pradhan you are concluding remarks um i would put it you know we usually consider health as a public good it should be available for everyone however technology is usually never considered as a public good and the marriage of these two is digital health and so uh, our focus is right now we're doing a lot of work which is related to uh, responsible innovation and ethics because i think that really needs to go forward very strongly so that uh, you know the, the good of it can be taken forward uh, that's what i would like to add thank you thank you very much uh, dr preeti pradhan uh, this was the last session uh, one of the uh, yeah dr uh, ashok if uh, uh, dr ashok uh, you want to make a line a statement uh, let me tell very i have been I remain as the chairman of UG committee and PG committee of MCI. When you talk about that, it is not necessary. I think we are doing a very great injustice to our our country. When pandemic started, the government closed down all the OPDs. Even AIMS OPD did not run in the pretext of less doctors. And when I was MBBS chairman, 66% of MBBS doctors were south of Nagpur. for the population of one third of the country and 63% post graduate doctors are south of nagpur the question is that every district of the, the of the tamil nadu has a medical college where in up for 220 million people there are six medical colleges so the question is a disproportionate and i do not agree that you don't require doctor then you should have robots if the technology is going to do why should have nurses and doctors what who is telling it is my, not my opinion go to who who say two third of the world population cannot have medicine or money for a single small minor surgery so we are talking about the poverty limitation economics digitalization and optimalism unless we use optimal education optimization because everything everything is not big university like mine or srm or amrita institute there are medical college without ct scans they have taken approval from mci in 3 years time nine either they have ct scan nor mr scan when they de recognize they say we'll do next time so question is that we have to see the less privileged people of this country so we have less doctors less nurses this is what mci website say we cannot tell that we don't need doctors how many doctors per capita if you take about south india for the population to doctor ratio is much higher than if you take jharkhand 
or Uttar Pradesh. So there is a disproportionate growth. So that is how we have to have equal distribution of resources in the country. Unless you have equal distribution, the digital health, no digital health is not going to work. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have nothing to against anybody. I have nothing. I just told the data which WHO and Government of India and MCI says. That is all in the records. Yeah, sir. Thank you very much, uh, uh, sir, both Dr. Are important. The machine and the man behind the machine. Both or the machine behind the man. Both are required. <laughs> Absolutely right, sir. Absolutely right. Especially in healthcare industry, without uh, the man and uh, there is no uh, empathy care that needs to be given where machine cannot give. Uh, with the, this, man or woman? the man or women? Yeah, man includes women. Yeah. Yeah. Preeti, I was about to uh, suggest that. And women more important <laughs> than man. Let's put it that way. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Dr. Rajiv has rightly mentioned they're more important than men. Uh, this uh, was the last session of this amazing conclave where galaxy of speakers, healthcare leaders, policy makers joined us. We would like to thank uh, the APAC Health Tech Innovation Conclave, which has been organized by APAC News Network. We are glad to uh, have this amazing uh, speakers from across the country presented by Dell Technologies Microsoft and our gold partner is Ognito Enhancing Healthcare Intelligence and Doxiva and Vibeo. And uh, we are also, this particular conclave has been supported by the government uh, organization and departments, including the Department of Science and Technology, Digital India, MyGov, National Informatic Center, uh, HSCC and Ministry of Ayush and uh, Government of Andhra Pradesh. Uh, we would like to thank each and every speaker. We would be documenting uh, each and every session in the form of a conclave report that would be reaching out to each and every speaker and the stakeholders in the healthcare as well as uh, uh, education sector. With this, myself, Sudhir Gautam, uh, uh, head for the South India and resident editor with the PAC News Network, and my entire team of APAC Health Tech and Innovation Conclave would like to thank each and everyone for more updates and uh, uh, the real-time updates have been done at, in the social media platforms, including LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. Uh, those who have missed the sessions, they can go and have a glimpse of it. With this, I would uh, like to thank on behalf of our entire team. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Thank you. Namaskar.